Hello, good evening. Thank you very much uh, for coming. It's always great to see uh, people back in the room at the JSC. Uh, welcome also uh, to the people who join us online, and we hope uh, some more people will join us who maybe didn't find the room uh, in the first attempt, which is always a problem in these hyper-securitized times. So my name is uh, Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center here at SOAS, and it is a great honor for me to present our guest speaker today, a one in the series that we were thinking about at the beginning of term, uh, Artists in Conversation, to really look what Japan has brought uh, to Western arts, what Western arts have brought to the practice uh, of Japanese art, and sort of to think in more detail, really in concrete cases, um, about what this intercultural communication means, what it stands for, it's an, uh, stands for, and what where it can take us. So tonight's speaker is the composer, um, director, and uh, musician uh, Francesca Lelohe. Uh, she joins us um, here. She's been she's uh, stayed in Japan. I, I just I bring up. It's a very long uh, biography, and she'll be talking. <laughs> very impressive uh, biography. Uh, she has worked on a number of very interesting uh, projects. Um, one was called How Was It For You, which uh, takes Mori Ogai's Vita Sexualis as a springboard uh, to explore sex education in Japan and the UK. And the second major work is Kagi, The Key, uh, based on the novella by uh, Tanizaki Junichiro, um, which is an immersive opera. So both in terms of genre and both in terms of presentation, uh, a really very new and interesting thing. And we will see during the talk some of the concrete uh, ways in which this has been realized. So without further ado, I hand over to you. Thank you very much for coming. And it's a Thanks pleasure. For having me. Yes. Hello. Uh, thanks very much for coming today in person and online. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me, um, Francesca Lillary. Uh, I studied music in the UK for my undergrad and my master's. And throughout that time, I came into contact with music written by Japanese composers uh, were in my flute lessons. And so I got really interested in the sound of the shakuhachi and then started to research a little bit more into the music of gagaku, which is a court music of Japan. And then just, you know, went down rabbit holes and was reading as much as I could. And I eventually felt that my interest in Japanese musics and cultures was influencing my own compositions. So I decided to, I had to go to Japan and actually experience it firsthand. Uh, so I was very fortunate to get a place on the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation uh, Scholarship Program. So I went in 2015, completed the scholarship and just stayed uh, for quite a while and kept uh, working with Japanese artists and one of the main projects I wanted to create was The Key which is an opera as Fabio has said it's inspired by the novella by Junichiro Tanizaki and yeah I'll be speaking about that today. So yeah, it's called a, a contemporary opera because it is it is a story told through music. Um, it is sung throughout. There are some spoken words as well, but it's staged. So opera seem like the best way of describing it. Uh, I'm sure most people are familiar with Tanizaki's work. Um, I don't know, has anybody read The Key or Kagi? Yeah. Yeah, yes, uh, I hope we should. <laughs> Clive played in it, so I should hope that he did read it. <laughs> Excellent research. Uh, yeah, so it's not one of uh, Tadazaki's most famous novels, I would say, but um, yeah, it's got a lot of common traits of Tadazaki in it, this exploring Western influence on uh, Japanese society, um, fetishism, uh, sort of difficulties of communication between the characters and so on. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about why it interested me in a bit. So the opera features three singers, a dancer, and um, four Japanese instruments and four instruments from 
Europe, like the Western classical tradition. And it's site specific. And by that mean, by that I mean it's not performed on a stage or in a concert hall, but it is performed in a specific place. So for this, it's in a house. So the the drama of the story is domestic. So it made sense for the opera to take place in a domestic setting. And there are performances happening in different rooms of the house and the audience freely just move throughout as the performance is unfolding. So that's what I mean by immersive. And the libretto, which is the text that the singers sing and recite, is in both English and Japanese. It sort of flips between the two throughout. So, yeah, I touched on it a little bit when I was talking about um, the key. I should probably speak a little bit more about uh, the novella itself. So the key is told through the diary entries of a husband and wife, and they're pretending that they're not reading each other's diaries, but they are. And they're using it as a way to tacitly communicate with each other about how they're dissatisfied with their love life. And then as you're, as the reader, as you're kind of going through reading the book, reading these stories, you also get a sense of the daughter and how she's involved. And you learn a bit about the lover, uh, a man called Kimura, that the, the father, uh, the, well, yeah, father of the daughter, the husband starts to push uh, the wife towards. So... Yeah, there's there's a lot about these difficulties to communicate face to face, even though they've been married for about 20 years. Um, there's a lot of talking about gender expectations. Yeah, the the husband's definitely struggling with the fact that he's struggling with getting older and with impotency in being impotent and and that being really difficult for him to deal with. And the the wife is kind of expected to be very demure and not have um, any kind of sexual uh, desires and so on. So there's, there's quite a lot of expectations that they challenge bit by bit. Uh, and changing cultural identities because they, all the characters sort of explore new ideas and uh, culture that's been brought in from the West. Because um, it's set in, in the 50s in Japan. So, uh, so yeah, so this is, these are all kind of underlying themes in the novel. And something that really, really interested me about it was as a reader, you're, you're also reading these diary entries. So you also feel that you're peering in on something that you shouldn't really be reading. Um, and you're also a bit of a detective because you're trying to work out, well, is the husband just saying that to manipulate the wife? Uh, what is the wife doing whilst um, the, you're reading the husband's diary? So, so you have there's a lot of guesswork. So I wanted to turn that reader experience into a audience experience, uh, and that informed the whole staging of the work. <coughs> so yeah, so we've got four characters, um, and I paired each character with one Japanese instrument and one Western instrument. And I was very specific with the pairings. I chose them to bring out the kind of psychological and emotional states of the characters and also their character traits. So this for me is what I thought was the best way of representing them. So that the instrumentalists really become part of the character. The character isn't only portrayed by a singer, but actually by the whole trio. Um, yeah, and so we have the husband and the wife. The daughter, she does the, there's nothing written from her perspective in the novel. So the whole daughter character that created in the opera is just gleaned from inferences and she's quite a new character that I created. Uh, and you'll also notice that Kimura, also again, nothing from, uh, from him in the novel, is portrayed by a dancer. And I did this because I thought he needed a more abstract art form uh, to portray him, so I didn't think uh, he should speak. Uh, I thought there should be more 
the more space for not only the audience, but also the characters to kind of imagine who is Kimura, what does Kimura mean to them? And I think Kimura means something very different to every character in it. So I chose a slightly more flexible, abstract art form to represent him. So, yeah, so these, um, I'm just going to show some photos from the performances in Tokyo 2019. Uh, so you can get a little sense of what they look like in each of their rooms. So we have the husband, um, accompanied by a double bass, and Shakahachi. And... And then we have the wife, who is accompanied by Sho and Cello. Is does everybody know what the show is? No. Um, so the show is a mouth organ. Uh, as you you can see, this one here. You hold it here. Um, so it's bamboo pipes, and each of them have a metal reed inside, and um, the sound is made by inhaling and exhaling, uh, and you have to heat it up. Um, so if you see in the video later, it's kind of like spinning it over a hob. That's what they're doing, um, which is it's a bit of a problem for risk assessments in the UK. Uh, but yeah, um, she was so yeah. So she was playing the show with the cello, um, and we have the daughter trios. We have the violin and yeah, but percussion because uh, well, we've got the kotsutsumi, which is the handheld. Question. Uh, so she uh, actually, Ogawa-san is often playing in kabuki um, and certain like Japanese orchestra um, ensembles as well. And then the shime daiko is the one just to her left, uh, which she would play with sticks. And then we have Kimura Trio. Uh, so. Yes, so originally I got Kimura uh, and yeah, uh, paired him with two instruments, so the biwa and the clarinet. Uh, later on, so the key was performed in, in Tokyo 2018 and then 2019, and then we brought it to London in 2019 as well. And it was actually various uh, budget issues that meant we couldn't bring everyone. Um, and uh, okay, can we find a beer player in the UK? No, can we find a beer player in Europe? Not really. <laughs> so you know, it's like, well, maybe we don't have a beer player and a clarinetist. And then Kimura doesn't have a trio, and he was free to move throughout the rooms and maybe interact a little bit more with the other characters. And actually, that made a lot more sense. I felt uh, so. It was interesting how how of a uh, a budget <laughs> constraint it actually sort of worked uh, quite well. So, because my idea for Kimura is that, yeah, he's seen, he means something different for every character. Uh, so I felt that if he were to go into the rooms or near where the other characters are, he could change his expression. He can become the version of Kimura that they see him as, if that, that sort of makes sense. There'll be questions later as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so so many important things about the music. They all rooms perform simultaneously. So wherever you are in the house, you, the audience will be moving through. You could you can go into one room and watch one trio, um, but you would probably still overhear music from the other trios or unfolding simultaneously. And that idea was so that as an audience member, you never get to see the full story. I intentionally want you to miss things. And that's because of the whole idea of reading these diary entries and you don't get the full story. You have to fill in the blanks yourself. And, you know, as you're reading the, you're following one character, it's not like all the other characters have stopped living. So that was the idea behind that. Um, and it really depends on the building, but sound bleed, so being able to overhear uh, these other rooms became a really important part of the piece and and not only just overhearing it but kind of uh sensing it um I remember we did an after talk on one of the performances and um and it was it was in Japanese and there was me and and the choreographer and we had a critic come and interviewers and and some of the uh, some of the performers took part as well and they're saying oh it's it's the k-high and, and I was just like 
don't know what that is, but it's probably it's probably right because all of a sudden it's like, mm. but um, I hope I remember correctly. But it, it's this this sort of sensing that um, a presence, and I think you really do get that. You sense uh, a presence of the other, the other performers, the other people in the room, the other audience members as well. Actually, that's something else we can talk about. Um, yeah. So I spoke a little bit about why I chose these instruments uh, but because and I say it's to really convey like, the emotional or the, the psychological states of the characters so like the daughter can be quite reactive um, so for me it felt quite good that she had maybe some explosive percussion um, and you know the violin can it can be a, a beautiful sweet voice but can also be really grainy and um, and it can also be really dynamic and uh, aggressive uh, points um the the wife is always trying to keep this sort of serene um perfectly poised give this presentation to people so so sort of having the show with these very high just floating tones made sense but then she's got the cello as well which i think can show a bit more of like an earthy kind of yeah, heartfelt emotion as well. And also give you some edges because she's got edges. So, yeah, so that was my idea. But then the way you hear these instruments also depends on where you are in the house um, and the furnishings of the house. Uh, as um, And, you know, these instruments were created for different places to be heard. So the, you know... The string instruments of like violin and, and cello have come to be developed so they sound great in a concert hall. And that's definitely can't be the said the same for say shakuhachi and biwa, where you you want to hear them in a room that's got the tummy flooring and your audience are quite close if if there being an audience because you might be obviously playing it for yourself for meditative purposes in the case of shakuhachi um, and you should be able to hear natural sounds of the, the natural world around you so yeah they've got different sonic capabilities and they're heard very differently in the spaces so i thought that was quite an interesting um fusion and a challenge as a composer uh yeah and i was t- talking about how Tanizaki was very concerned with this Western influence in Japan and how the characters responded to that and how they um, maybe flirted with it. Um, for instance, I don't want too many spoilers, but uh, the wife would put on Western dress when she was going out to the movies with Kimura. and But then she would definitely wear kimono when she was at home speaking with her husband. So they sort of using what they want from both cultures for whatever situation suits them best was my reading of it uh so that's why i thought it was good to have an an instrument representing both cultures say um to portray the characters and i also chose the those instruments the japanese instruments because i felt a bit more comfortable with them so during my time in japan i i did study and take lessons um on shakuhachi biwa show i played in a gagaku ensemble on the show um so i was sort of playing to my own strengths a bit as well it's actually really hard writing an opera if you hadn't guessed (laughs) and this is like writing four operas because they all happen at the same time so (laughs) nice um yeah, we're speaking about this recently uh, in the context of cross-cultural uh, composition. And of course, it's cross-cultural because you've got Japanese instruments and Western instruments. But I think it's really also cross-cultural like within Japanese cultures. Um, because the instruments come from really different traditions so that and and they have a whole different repertoire and way of playing so and and notations so like um the shakuhachi 
and the, the show do not use the same kind of notation. They don't play together. You wouldn't, they don't really exist in the same world. Um, and then you've got, we had different singing styles uh, because they weren't all opera singers. Um, actually, each time we've done it, one of the singers has been from more of an acting background, um, usually the daughter, twice as being an actor. So that gives a very different quality. And then when the Biwa was involved in Kimura's trio, um, they also sung or narrated, and then that's got a very different kind um, of quality as well. Uh, the dancer, so the dancer, actually, we I worked with two dancers, but they were both physical theatre actors, and they worked with a choreographer who was from a Buto background. I don't know how many people know about Buto in here, probably. Yeah. Um, so it was inspired by Buto. It wasn't like strict following um these kind of characters that are often within uh Buto. But uh yeah, so that was a totally different that you know, you wouldn't see a Buto dancer with the Shakachi usually as well. So a whole different mix there. Um and the architecture. Oh, yes. So when we did the performances in Japan, they were in traditional style houses with tatami floors, shoji, suma, that sort of thing. Not the case when we did it in the UK. But um, yeah, I think I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, yeah, so... And then the the costumes, again, a very different thing with the, the UK. Uh, for the wife and she was wearing kimono in japan but it didn't really make sense for her to wear a kimono in the uk so um yeah we we changed that to um but still like something that would make sense for a sophisticated japanese woman of around middle age to wear uh yes yeah, so you've got a lot of different elements coming together i would say um to represent these multi faceted characters uh and yeah to like I was trying to say to try and resonate well in the house you know sometimes we had to play with levels and you'd have to I lost a lot of weight when doing this opera because there was like running from one room to the other quite a lot they're like okay we have to this has to be quieter now you can afford to play louder uh yeah because like I was saying the instruments are built for different things uh some unexpected results for me as a composer um was yeah that sort of delving into how these Japanese instruments um uh the, their repertoire how they play their 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 modes of behavior when they're performing as well but the sort of their ideas about ornamentation um and also like the oral tradition like there's they have sheet music like the, a lot of their pieces be written down, but then that's like the very base of it. That's the basic level. And then if you want to learn how to actually perform it, you learn by listening and following your teacher. And and then there's just so much more freedom in quite a lot of them, like the the way that um, freedom in, in tempo or freedom in taking a breath and the space is really important. And all of that, actually really influenced how I wrote the music for all instruments and singers combined. Um, yeah, which meant that I did struggle a bit with how to write it all in Western notation, so it's in like a five-line stave. I chose to do that because that was a way that, that was like the common language uh, that everyone could read, but it is a bit of a compromise. Um, so there were definitely some points where I was just like, oh, I could just do a big scribble or a squiggle like that because that's kind of what we want and then we could talk about it and then that will work, um, which which was the best way sometimes. But um, yeah, there was definitely some issues there. Uh, yeah, well, Clive would be happy to know. I, I think the creative process was shaped by the performers and their instruments. So it, yeah, it became really apparent that we had so many different experiences and skills in the rooms and that was really going to benefit the piece and these 
yeah, these different playing sensibilities. Um, when I say experiences, like we had some people who were excellent improvisers, um, but we had some people who um, were more like experts in the kind of like the contemporary music uh, field. And then had somebody who played vaudeville, kind of like um, com comedic music. Uh, uh, so, and, and, and then actors as well and a choreographer. And, you know, you can, it meant that this project provided something new for everyone involved and a new challenge for everyone, um, but also hopefully enabled them to bring what was unique about them into the project. And I think that really strengthened it. Uh, yeah, so we did a lot of discussing and sharing of ideas throughout the whole rehearsal process. Uh, yeah, and improvisation and this kind of guided improvisation and giving space, especially for the, to the Japanese instrument players to improvise and add ornamentation in a way that was idiomatic for their instrument became uh, really important as well. So that was a good challenge for me for some performers who hadn't experienced that so much before. So shall we watch some, I think? Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm going to play, we have, uh, so the, the opera is about an hour to an hour and a half long, so we're not going to watch it all. But um, I have a trailer video from the Tokyo premieres that I thought would be good to look at. Uh, oh, where is it? <laughs> Just yes. Yeah. It's behind this one if you look. Oh, yeah. oh okay. All right. We can we can also <laughs> or not. Okay. <laughs> That's too. Okay. But desperate times call for desperate measures. Your wife please read yonder, Mita, please. Papa 
I have to read about their love life. I hate my husband. Thank <laughs> you. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's a bit of <laughs> that's a bit of the uh we do questions at the end, but I'd love to hear yeah, what you think. Um, anyway. Yeah, okay. So this little quote here is a question that was posed by uh, the International Shakuhachi Festival Prague Symposium uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, should these musical wor worlds coexist or create a whole new world altogether? So... I mean, I don't think they're trying to make a rule or anything, but I was thinking about it in respect to the key, and I think that th there's no way they can coexist. They have to work together to create a the specific world of the key, and that's because the it's all about portraying the characters and telling this story, um, and the instruments, they're so integral to the drama. So... Yeah, I, and I think that together, these these combinations of the instruments really working together, well as long as as well as all these 
aleatoric so there's kind of random elements so each room is unfolding in its own time and there are some cues about where they match up but it is quite free so every performance is slightly different um and and of course the audience they are totally free you never know what an audience is going to do um uh, and uh, they're all in totally different rooms every every audience member has a different experience to another audience member so they're all experiencing the sonic world in their own way and the acoustics and the natural environment the the time of year when we performed it it was we did we did a research and development performance in in august one and in 2017 and so we had um this the sounds of the not yet dead cicadas um and whereas in may it was slightly different and uh yeah sort of i think all of these factors come together to to create a whole new sonic world in my opinion so yes yeah, so in august 2019 uh we brought the key to london as part of tete tete the opera festival and it was I'd always kind of had the idea, I'd love to do it in the UK, and I wanted to bring the Japanese instrument players from Japan's pair with UK-based uh, players, like the, the clarinet and the violin and the and the cello, and then maybe to have half of the performers um, of the characters, so the, the two of the singers, or maybe a singer and a dancer from Japan and, and two singers from the UK. That was my idea. Um, but in we actually then ended up building it with pretty much everyone who was based in Europe and we brought one singer and the dancer over from Japan and we were sort of thinking for a little while should we try and do it in a Japanese house in the UK or should we really embrace this new context uh, and we actually did it in a very kind of modern sort of uh 1960s originally um architect's house it was very swish very stylish um so that really affected the staging of the performance and we had to we decided to keep the story the same but change the context so the idea was it was a Japanese family who had moved to the UK started their life there and the daughter had been born in the UK uh, to try and make it make sense we didn't the, the whole idea is that you when you walk into the house and you walk into the performance of the key is that you're immersed in it and it would be such a shame if you walked into it and felt like you were watching a weird stage performance and you weren't really involved and um, that it didn't quite match so we've actually changed the staging to suit every venue it's got to be responsive I think uh, yeah, so it's also a modern house, so it kind of updated the 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 context a bit. So that was reflected in the the costumes that the the performers wore. Uh, but I kept the text, the libretto, largely the same. It was still Japanese English. I felt that was really important. It just kind of put a few sections that was very long in Japanese, and and at the start of each um, movement that the that they play uh, they sing the date of the diary entry and I just changed all of that to English to try and give the audience a bit of a, a hook so they could get involved but um yeah it was and the main thing was adapting it to to fit the the venue and the context so I thought we could watch a little bit of that if you like as well so it's a, a full video so I'll just show like a section of it Oh, my God. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, that's all I have to say anyway. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that would be a great time if you have any questions. Uh, thank you so much for listening today. Um, and they, I have a website that is dedicated to the key so www.thekeyopera.com if you want to have a little look um in your own time as well cheers thank you <laughs> thank you very much Let, let's quickly bring the light up now oh yeah that's better thank you so much that was really fascinating i'm sure you have lots of questions but i, I wanted to start by by asking something very concrete, because it's, I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant idea to, to take something that the characters think of unspeakable, they can't talk about it, but they write about it, but mm -hmm. then you transform it into singing. And so they sing about it, but of course they don't hear each other's voices. The audience is mm -hmm. the only, um, the, the audience are the only ones who actually hear what is being performed. And I was wondering, there was there was a, a and, and sort of the, the, the spatial compartmentalization is maintained to a certain degree, but mm. there's also exchange. There's one moment where where Kimura hands a, a picture, mm. but you could speak a little bit about the the the, the, the photographs and, mm. and their role because they seem to be the thing that is exchanged, that is the only thing that can actually go from one mm -hmm. room to the other. Yeah. Um 
there were a couple of moments where we sort of broke the rules, um, which I felt was just really important um, for the drama. But yeah, like you say, most of the time, the audience are let into this very intimate space and they're the only ones who can really listen to their stories. Um, but there were just, there were certain points that were so important in the drama that I thought had to be shown. So yeah, the passing of the photographs uh, is one. And then actually at the very end of the opera, they are all brought together, um, which again, just seemed, this sort of had to to bring it to a close in a way and had to wanted to bring the whole audience together at the end as well so that seemed an, an important way of doing it but then they, they stand out as very important moments because it's not happened throughout the whole thing I think does that make sense yeah. <laughs> yes please questions from the floor you even have some members of the audience that you could see <laughs> yeah <laughs> And players. And players. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, so we have one here and then we'll come to you. Yes, yes. please. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, it was a pleasure to see the performance in wherever it was, um, um, Dulwich, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, thank you. and uh, a pleasure to be reminded of it from you know, what was three years ago. And, and um, a couple of comments and a question. I mean, your, I mean, your description at the outset, I mean, was very helpful, but it's also it's certainly what your initial description you could one could get as an audience member. You know what you were saying was, yeah, I didn't, I didn't sense the absent B word and the three clarinets. Mm. But apart from that, you know, I you could get what was supposed to happen. You know, <laughs> and if anything, I would also say that. I could hear more th there in in the you know around the house mm -hmm. than you could necessarily um, in in the video. Um, in fact, I would say your description of it reminded me more of my experience than than the video. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, um, it's incredibly difficult to represent in yeah. film. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and which, which kind of gets me towards my question. Mm. Um, so I, I'm sure I wasn't there when the cameras were there. And obviously that involves the more choices. And I'm, you know, that's, um, I can't help thinking of um, a comment that Tony Rain said about Tarama Shuji, um, the theater and film person. And he did a show in Amsterdam where everybody was going to go around in, in their own cars and get unique mm. experiences. Mm. And he is a critic, sort of went in one of the cars and Terry Armour could say, oh, no, no, you don't go in that car. You know, you go in this car. And so, you know, it wasn't entirely as rad <laughs> as you know. Yeah, yeah. And obviously the same for your filming. So can you say a little bit more about the choices of your filming, please? Yeah. Um, well, with the UK film, the, the two, we had two videographers who arrived about two hours before the performance and said so what do you want us to do <laughs> um, and they said well it happens in four different rooms and went, what uh I said yeah <laughs> over two different floors of the house uh, um okay so, so okay well then I picked up a few moments sort of like the the passing of the photographs and some kind of basically key moments that I think an audience member maybe needs to know in order to form this story so that they don't come out of it missing the opportunity to see how multifaceted the characters are. I mean, it would be a, such a shame if you walked out and just thought, oh God, that wife is awful. She just wants to kill her husband because then you would you would miss um, so much. So, so I picked up a couple of moments, but also some of those important moments the music is louder in those rooms and it's quieter or not at all in one or the other rooms or the dancer is physically moving into that space. So the audience are really free, but they're given hints. Mm -hmm. um, and audience members are, again, very welcome to just stand in a quiet space where no one is performing and, and or, or do the exact opposite of the, the, the crowd. But... Um, 
the way that I've kind of guided the music so you can pick up these anchor points of the story inform the filming. With the Tokyo ones, the videographers came to rehearsals and every performance and then we pieced together a trailer at the end and then that's a bit different for a trailer you you want to you want to give people something a bit juicy so they get a bit interested but you also don't want to give all the story away but you also want to try and give a sense of the whole thing um so that was just quite a lot of back and forth um between me and the video editors uh deciding okay we there was a, there was a shot in the trailer where you the the camera went from one room into the next room into the next room and I thought that was really important because it shows that the spaces were open and um and that the audience could actually see in that house two rooms at the same time sort of thing mm. so yeah those that kind of informed how we did the filming and how we made the trailers but I just I, I, mm. in 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 my experience of you know in in the performance. Mm. Yes, you must have guided me. There was obviously something that was started at the first, or it was louder than the others, and I mm. went there. And then, um, yes, then you were aware of something happening over there. And <laughs> but you're, I'm, you know, here, and I'm closer to these performers than you, you know, I am to you now. Yeah. And it seems kind of disloyal and, and rude, you know, just to just walk out. You know. <laughs> Um, so you know, eventually I got it and realised yes, I did have to move, and mm. um, I had to have an inconstant loyalty, which was <laughs> you know part of the show. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, a lot of people said the same thing. It was <laughs> like, yeah, I quite like that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, there's a question in the back. I just wondered how, how you managed to write for a show in uh, B1. Uh, you said you don't to play them when you're in Japan. But, but... Oh God, no, I had a panic dream that um, <laughs> someone couldn't turn up and I had to do it. Um, um, yeah, no, no, I wasn't tempted to do it myself. But I think as a composer, like I can't play the trumpet, but I know how the trumpet works and I can write for trumpet. So... Yeah. Um, so in in some ways, that's quite similar to just as as your work as a composer uh, and then the other way is just sitting down with the performer and discussing okay if I want this kind of sound or I want to create this kind of atmosphere I think it should be like this what do you think and they say oh well, maybe I could play it with this technique or um or maybe if you put it in this register it'd be a bit lower or higher it'd be a bit more effective for for their particular instrument and so that back and forth helps you to shape the music I actually, um, I've brought some samples of the scores and the libretto, the text, if anybody wants to have a look. Um, I can put them on the table if, if you want to have a look. I've also brought um, some shakuhachi and show music, like written in the the notation that they would use if you want to like, compare. Have it. Thank you. <laughs> As a composer, I'm just curious, is to hear your experience working with uh, the Japanese instrumentalists, because the repertoire is very different, the notation is very different, and the sense of timing is different, <laughs> because a lot of them don't have a very strict sense of counting. Um, you neither do singers, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no, people have experience with dealing with them. Um, <laughs> when you are developing the score, what strategy do you use to contextualize everything? Because you have the Western instrumentation and then you have the, 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 the Japanese one. How do you do synchronization and expect mm. between the Western and, and, and the, the, the Japanese? Yeah, so the, the Japanese instrumentalists, um, Japanese instrument players I was working with, they all read Western notation. So that meant, okay, we can use that as the, the common language and so everyone will understand what's going on. Um, so, but then, yes, like that you say, definitely this kind of timing. I think, I think there, was a, there was points where just in the rehearsal, I'd say, I've put a pause here and you just breathe and, and and then making it clear like okay I want you to follow the violinist here I want you to follow the percussionist here because it just needs a bit more space or because you're you you know they're very much 
uh, linked with the performers, there was quite a lot of cues from them. So we're like, oh, she needs a moment to turn the page. So when she lifts her head up or something, maybe the cue can come from the performers. So it's quite a lot of physical cues. It was definitely a way of getting sort of around that. Um, and then, say, for the shakuhachi, for instance, like I might write the, the, I'll write the melody line. Um, but then ornamentation for some specific ornamentation that I knew I wanted, like I want Moraiki here, like the the overblowing boom sort of sound here. But then the rest of the time, maybe I'm just, you know, I'm up for you bring what you want to bring. Let's see what that works. And because I've written the dynamics or if, or they know what's happening in the words, so they know the the context. So there was, so we could be a bit more free about how to to shape their line. Um, but yeah, I guess was kind of. I mean, in terms it. of, there was four concurrent theme of drama or music. Yes, yeah, yeah. How much coordination do you have between them? A little bit. Um, sometimes it was say for the passing the photo. It um, so it'd be so I'd say to one room, especially if they were next door, be like wait until they've finished that movement or you hear that line and then you can start or something. Um, or sometimes it was even for balance uh, in the different buildings where, okay, it's too loud. Usually it was okay if these two rooms were going at the same time, but in this different house, they have to be a bit more spacious. So one has to wait for a bit. And um, so to the singer, you be reading your diary at this point and it's just quiet. Uh, so this is the other thing, they're always acting. It's like they're constantly on stage and the instrumentalists as well. But, um, so there was a bit of freedom there about that kind of thing. That's sort of how we did it. So there were little cues, but it wasn't strict because, number one, I think that would be impossible. <laughs> and number two, that's not what I wanted because I wanted it to feel like they were living and that you'd really walked into someone's weird house and you would kind of you know that there, there was an actual realness to it i think no thank you yes please Hi, just to say i was really inspired by at the beginning you were talking about your concept i was just like wow what amazing concept and then to come fast forward to the end of the presentation we get to see it um, i was unfortunately get to see it in my life but i just for me that's really exciting inspiring to see you have this idea that unites all your patterns of interest and then just to be able to take it right through to completion that's quite inspiring for me as a you know, kind of early on in my stage of like projects and stuff like that. I wanted to ask you about how this process was from the conception of the initial idea when you probably just first came mm -hmm. to this. How long how long were you working on the idea before you brought it into fruition? What support did you have at a technical level? She mm -hmm. cares about that very much. Uh, yeah, it was really long. I actually came up with the idea when I was living in Scotland and I came across the key in a secondhand bookshop and it said Tanizaki. It's like, oh, yeah, I know Tanizaki. And I pulled it out. It had a naked lady on the front. I thought, oh, that looks interesting. <laughs> so obviously I bought it um, and then was reading it and then had the idea for the concept. Like, oh, it could be very initial like it could be staged and then develop it more it's like oh it should be staged in a in a building oh it should have you know people at different rooms oh that'd be great and then obviously the ideas got bigger and bigger and bigger but I was just studying my master's at that time and it was living in Scotland um so I had all these ideas that initial concept was there but then it just sort of sat there for a while so that was maybe like 2011 or 2012 and then I moved to Japan 2015 and and was doing um, the scholarship and then was coming towards the end of the scholarship I thought okay that idea I've had in the on the back burner maybe we could revisit that now I've actually got a bit more understanding maybe I can now try read the key in Japanese as well and um um, and then I thought, oh, well, now it could also have Japanese instruments in it because that would make sense because I hadn't thought about that originally. I hadn't thought about doing the, the text in English and Japanese originally because I didn't know any Japanese as well at so, uh, the, the time. So I guess going on the scholarship kind of accelerated it and came to the end of the scholarship and thought, okay, now I'm ready to do something and then started developing it. So that um, was like 
maybe March 2017 that we did an, a research and development. So we tried out about 20 to 30 minutes worth of material um, to sort of test, does my crazy idea work? And, um, and, and getting people interested and involved and so on. And I was fortunate to meet a producer who was based at the uh, Geidai, the Tokyo University of the Arts. And so, and then they said, oh, you should try it in this um, space that's been bought by a, an arts community organization. Um, and then you could work with them. And so it was a lot of just like meeting people and talking to the right people and getting them excited to for them to then get other people excited for it to sort of snowball a bit. Um, and then lots of unpaid work <laughs> um, and then applying for funding and um and yeah and just building the right team of people to get really invested in it so yeah it took quite I guess it took quite a while <laughs> thank you uh people online please feel free to put your questions into the uh, Q and A function we have one more question from the floor and then we have a question from uh virtual space Barbara Abraham you'll be up next so please yeah I wanted to ask a bit more about the underlying structure of the music mm -hmm. I mean presumably it's driven by the structure of the story obviously but I'm wondering if there's some sort of I was going to say key structure but um, I mean, it's atonal, right? So it doesn't have any keys, ironically. Um, <laughs> but is is there some kind of underlying structure to the music um, through the piece? Yeah, the, I guess there is thematic material. Um, so there's there's a melody as a theme um, that happens first in the the husband's room, and then. For me, that kind of is maybe a motif in a way for and that happens when the husband is doing one particular thing so then when the wife is reflecting on it it's sort of echoed in the cello in her room and then when the the daughters may be talking about it it sort of it comes into a new variation a new role in her room so there is there's certain material that kind of links them all together um yeah it does it's not in a key um it's it is atonal but it's it's also got quite a lot to do with the show is is the pictures are set, um, and there are certain chords that resonate really beautifully in the show. So that actually has quite a, a lot of implication, um, harmonic implication in um, those rooms. Yeah, no, throughout really. Um, yeah, so there's yeah there is definitely quite a bit of progression there, but it's it's not like a Western tonal harmony sort of thing. Thank you. So we have one question from Barbara Abraham. Hello, Barbara. Can you hear us? You may have to unmute yourself. All right. Um. Hello? Okay, we make up. Oh, no, 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 sorry. We may come back to you. Is there any other questions? Yes, please. I was just wondering at, at what stage in the composition did you know who the performers were going to be? And were elements of what you composed specific to the people who are going to be the first performers and I'm thinking with this kind of project where there's a certain amount of flexibility and interaction and improvisation with say for example the later works of Luigi Dono mm -hmm. he was composing the poor people he knew so he even writes in the score the names of the performers mm -hmm. not soprano cello or whatever but the names of the performers mm -hmm. was there anything like that with your process and how did it, and if there was, how did it then affect the overall effect of the work when other people performed it instead? Yeah, I knew the, I knew quite a lot of the performers before I'd started. So, yes, for some of them, it did influence it. Especially, there are some semi pro amateur performers in there. Um, so that affected how 
like the complexity that um of the music that I wrote for them uh and then also sort of knowing their strengths a bit like I knew the double bassist was a great improviser so that sort of thing um it did affect it and then when I had some different performers the second time around in Tokyo and also in London yeah sometimes I did have to make certain adjustments um also well like a major one like for the 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 singer Hiroshi who plays the the husband um is actually younger than the daughter in uh in, in london we got like some a uh, hairspray <laughs> make it a bit gray but um he's a tenor not a baritone so there were a couple of movements that i it, i just moved it up a third like i had to adapt it slightly because it would fit better in his range um the the two people the first daughter and the last daughter, because they were more actors. Sometimes I'd written music. It was a process of getting to know them through the rehearsals and then making some adaptations um, as well. So yeah, it did, it, it became quite personal. And that's why I think creating it really was um, a credit to everyone involved and it was quite influenced by it. Okay, let's try again. Barbara, Barbara Abraham, are you there? Incredible silence. Now. Okay. Right. Yes, I, I, I actually I can write over. But if there's any more questions, yes, please. Yes, Lucia. Um, I'd like to hear more about the audience, uh, the mm. Japanese audience. What was the reaction there? Whether they moved from one place to the other? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, a, a mixture. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> this, yeah, some people would just sit and watch. <laughs> and very, and um, But even in the UK as well, we did talk about should we have ushers for a while, like people who could just gently say, it's okay, you 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 can move now. We didn't want to be too, we don't want to guide people too much. But um, so what we did do is we kind of had ushers near the start because it takes people a while to understand what's going on and to get comfortable in the space. So, and it, and, and it starts with everyone in one room and then they overhear the other rooms and then they're free to move. So they, we did need people to just go, and now you can get up and move um, at the start. But then after that, people start to get used to it and then they don't really need any help. And they did, yeah, and they did move around um, or take a seat and just kind of, yeah, listen to all the, all the other rooms as well. Um, sometimes they stood incredibly close to the performers. <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes, yeah, but it was, yeah. Interesting, yes. Um, yes, please. Mm. Thank you. Um, tell us, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the house in, in, in London, in Dulwich. Mm. I mean, you, you said it was not a Japanese house, but I, in, in my, the, my suspended disbelief i saw it as a japanese house around this, mm. this garden that's sort of um looking well but very in a very formal way mm -hmm. and um it wasn't it was a well-lit house mm. but somehow i got the gloominess of the rumors and the, the oppression of these rumors you know and what what does she know about what he knows about he she knows about. um anyway so, so what, yeah what, yeah, yeah. much choice in the house um well, uh, uh, my producer here suggested it. She'd met an architect and they were willing. It was actually, people actually lived in that house. So we had to wait for the teenage son to get up in the morning. Let's <laughs> get in the grave. <laughs> Take down like the football pitch. <laughs> it's not a glamorous life. What a good life. But, um, but yeah, and uh, so, and, and I was in Japan. I didn't get to see the house before we did our first rehearsals. I just, um, Luckily, a couple of people of the team had been and they took a video around and said to me, I was really nervous, really nervous before the start because I thought it's got massive windows, which is totally different. Um, it's got hard floors. It's 
yeah is it gonna gonna work at all it's got like colorful um furnishings and so on so I was really nervous but then thought more about kind of like the essence of it and decided it sort of intensified this peeking in a bit because intensifies the voyeurism a bit I think because you've got these massive windows mm. but they're not actually communicating but they're just peering in on each other they're, and they're you know they're performing for each other in a way like oh no I really don't care about you oh I'm going to flirt with this man and you know um so it intensified that um and yeah and it did have kind of like sliding spaces the spaces could be uh changed quite a bit which worked really well uh and also it it felt a bit like a model home in a way like this is where a happy family should live so having a really dysfunctional family in that space I thought also like heightened that that sense of they, they really can't communicate with each other and they're really not happy in each other's spaces um so yeah and then I thought okay <laughs> it worked Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, this is like a lot of like observations. I've seen two mm. performances in Japan and in the one in London. Um, this just remind me of Tanasaki's book, In Place of Shadow. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether you have any view on that, how the darkness mm. in the Japanese home and suddenly it's, it's the atmosphere is completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It feels so much more impressive because it's so much. It's the, I don't know what it is. It's actually mm. somehow it affects the way I listen to the piece as well. Mm. So you have that opinion about the, the, even the, the lighting of the display. Yes, like when we were staging it in the Japanese houses with these the, the tummy floors and the shoji, like it, it just felt it has to be dark. It has to be, you know, it has, and, and also it had to be very natural, like a lamp that you would just have in the house because it felt it would be really weird if there was a spotlight. Um, so, and it would be really weird in that kind of setting if you had a very bright watt bulb. Um, anyway, so, yes, yeah, so that that was definitely a consideration. So there was another reason why I was really nervous about bringing it to the UK. That's going to be really bright. Um, and it was in summer, so it's going to be really light outside as well with these big windows. Um, but I think it worked. Um, but I think it maybe would have, it, yeah, maybe it would have felt really strange if we'd made it really bright in a Japanese house or we tried to make it gloomy. Might be, might felt really strange if we tried to put windows and, and uh, like curtains and screens and things in the UK house to try and make it artificially gloomy because it's yeah it's not gloomy is it it's this it's this um the shadow that's yeah yeah and uh and and something even the the choreographer she was really nervous about the the house in the UK because she was saying but there's no humidity and there's no damp and there's no mold <laughs> <laughs> it's like, she's like, you know, it should just be a bit sticky. Is it? <laughs> I guess so. But like, and you don't get that in the UK house. But I guess also that sort of, that kind of <laughs> stickiness in a way fits well in the humid um, the houses in Japan. For, for this pressurized, uncomfortable story, it's a bit uncomfortable to watch. It sort of should be a bit uncomfortable to watch. So everyone's a bit uncomfortable talking about the issues so I didn't want it to feel clean in in the UK in a way. I mean, sticky yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> a hint of mold yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you any last questions <laughs> oh yes Sam what's next yes oh, that was my last yeah. question <laughs> <laughs> um Yes, yeah, so what's next? So, well, this year, hopefully, I will be doing another immersive piece or we do some research and development. Uh, I'm going to do it in my hometown, very different to Japan. Uh, we're going to do it in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, it's an immersive piece exploring a woman who was accused of witchcraft in the 1600s. And uh, the idea is there's lots of different perspectives. You know, the, the priest was saying she was satanic. And then you have the people in the pub sharing all their rumors and myths and stories. So I want to turn that into a, a kind of an immersive piece where the audience hear these different viewpoints, 
and they can choose different ways. And then in the end, they're going to be surrounded by a choir of of people and, and the choir will be made up of women uh, non-binary and trans people uh who will represent um the story of the the character molly lee the woman who was accused of witchcraft uh so that's every in the summer and then be developed into performances in 2024 2025 um and then japan the end of this year i'm curating a concert uh and in this concert i've got a new piece for biwa uh, and voice. Uh, so the Biwa's repertoire is generally about war, battles, um, telling the myths. And I was thinking, well, what about women's stories and women's battles? So I'm writing a new piece for Biwa um, about a feminist anarchist, uh, Itonoe, who was uh, around in the early 1900s. Um, so it's going to be a way of kind of like exploring her life and talking about her battles. And then I'm creating a concert around it or feature music by Japanese women composers from the early 1900s as well. Thank you. And we just got in the first question online but from uh, Dr. Yona Siderer. Uh, who's asking, there's an interest in Israel and Japanese culture, both the key and in praise of shadows were translated into Hebrew. Would you consider bringing the opera to Israel? <laughs> I'd certainly consider it. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, that would, yeah. Would have, well, yeah, uh, as long as you can work with like a Israeli dramaturg, I think, because it's really important to craft the piece for the context that's going to be performed and experienced in. But um, yeah, sure. Thank Definitely you. a yes then. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. Thank you for a, such oh, a fascinating you. presentation. Give a big round of applause, please. And um, yes, we're looking forward. Maybe the um, anarchist feminist piece could be performed also in a sort of, you know, maybe in some kind of collaboration with uh, local um, Japan-related institutions. That'd be yeah. fantastic. Yes, I'd like to bring it to the UK. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you. And if anybody wants to have a look. Oh yes, please have a look at the notation. Um, and we also, we have, I just wanted to remind you, we have three more official events on the 16th of May. We have the last um, in the series of Japan and Sports Symposium organized by Helen McNaughton um, in the presence of the Ambassador of Japan. So that's on a Tuesday, not on a Wednesday. And then we have a talk by the Abbot of the Daigoji um, and uh, the Director of the Terra Space who are planning to launch a space temple in 2004. So definitely something also to look uh, forward to. That's on the 26th of, uh, sorry, 24th of May, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. And our final event is with our good friend, Professor Stephen Dodd, who will talk about the political symbolism of flying saucers in Mishima's Utsukushi Hoshi, Beautiful Star, a novel that was serialized um, that wasn't really part of the canon of Mishima's writing, uh, but that he has translated and that is now available in Penguin Classics. So please do put that down in your diary and do return. Thank you. <laughs>